Brianna, what's on your radar? Well, when most of us heard about the latest mass shooting that occurred yesterday, a cruel, violent, deeply tragic event in which 19 children were murdered and two teachers were murdered by a gunman carrying a weapon and crashing his car into the side of a building, we experienced pain, horror, shock, relief, or perhaps anger. In contrast to that, former Vox columnist and blogger Matt Iglesias followed a different instinct. Matt Iglesias, former Vox columnist and blogger, and a parent, tweeted, For all its very real problems, one shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the contemporary United States of America is one of the best places to live in all of human history. And there's a reason tons of people of all kinds from all around the world clamor to move here. As the country struggles to understand the murder of elementary school children, at school, a place they go to learn times tables and read Maniac McGee and trade lovingly packed lunch snacks, Matt Iglesias was quick to remind us that despite it all, America is one of the best places in the world to live. And one of the best places in the world to live, we've had 27 school shootings in just the first five months of 2022. Now let's compare. Australia has experienced, experienced six since 1991. Brazil has had five since 2001. Germany has had only eight since 1913. Lithuania and Sweden have had one, the UK three, five in South Africa since 1994. And according to Matt, while those numbers might seem a good deal better than what we've experienced in the United States, again, 27 in 2022 alone so far, it's a good reminder that we shouldn't complain because, after all, America is one of the best places to live in all of human history. Now, I don't bring up Matt Iglesias' tweet because he's especially important, nor do I mention it in an effort to mete out some sort of punishment for a controversial, tasteless, attention-seeking take. It is obvious what he's doing, and the good citizens in his Twitter mentions have been thorough in explaining exactly why Iglesias is, per one of the kinder tweets I can read here, the worst. I bring it up because his rhetorical maneuver is not actually an unusual one. In fact, it's a troublingly common one. This time it's receiving what I think is a proportionate amount of blowback because most people understand that there is a time and place to brag about your country, and it's not while children's bodies are being identified by their parents hours after your country's 27th school shooting this year. But the idea that America's achievements justify its failures is a common trope deployed by those who thrive under our deeply unequal system and who want to leverage sincerely held pride in this country to make sure nothing ever changes for the better, to make sure nothing ever gets better for you and your children because they're just fine under the status quo. Now, I wanna be clear, this is not an anti-American screed. Too many liberals get caught up in arguing against America's obvious benefits, when I think most people have a natural affection for home, no matter how complicated our American family can be. I was born in Washington, D.C., right here in our nation's capital, to an American from Virginia and an American from Ohio. My paternal grandfather proudly worked on Navy boats despite being denied union work on account of his race, and my great-grandfather fought proudly for his freedom in the United Color Troops during the Civil War. My maternal great-grandfather came from a family, grand, grandmother rather, came from a family of sharecroppers in South Carolina who fled to the North in an effort to escape discrimination and racial violence and find opportunity. She had four children, one of whom my grandmother became a registered nurse, and she had my mother, who became a teacher, who had me. My story is as American as apple pie and is marked with all of the opportunities available in this country, as well as all the cruelties it can inflict on people through no fault of their own, like healthcare failures, exploitative wages, and state-backed racial discrimination. And I don't struggle at all with allowing two truths to lie in my brain at once, that there are things about my country I love deeply, and there are things about it that I feel is my patriotic duty to fight to change. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution, they didn't high-five, chest bump, and declare it the best Constitution ever, or insist that America was perfect or unimpeachable. No, as I'm sure you're aware, the preamble asserts that the Constitution was established to promote a more perfect union. 
It implies that the progress of this country is never complete. It was an aspirational document, one that has been amended over time to abolish slavery, to extend voting rights, to formally enslave people into women, and to provide for due process rights. One of the things that I admire about this country is that aspirational spirit. Where would we be if people hadn't fought to make the world a better place for their children than it was for them? If the workers who struggled for workplace safety in mines, in clothing factories, and on farms had simply shrugged and said, at least we have it better than we did in Ireland or Poland or than our native-born grandparents did. What if our forefathers and mothers had looked at the 40% of seniors that used to live in poverty prior to the Social Security Act of 1935 and said, hey, at least we're a global power. How can we complain? If they never fought for more perfect, how much less perfect would we be today? I don't think patriotism is resting on one's laurels or gloating like kids with an unearned trophy over the accomplishments of your ancestors. I think it's working to make the country more perfect as the Founding Fathers intended. This belief, which I hold closely, is why I admit I was triggered by Iglesias' tweet. The idea of American superiority, American exceptionalism, isn't just used to justify why nothing can be done to bring America's gun violence rate in line with other similar countries. It's used as a response to questions about how to make the country more equal, how to help the poor, how to provide health care for millions of Americans who worry that cancer could cause them, cost them their homes. Pundits like Steven Crowder, Ben Shapiro, and Charlie Kirk have argued that America is the greatest country in the world as a way to cut off legitimate questions about how it could be improved. But of course, one doesn't cancel out the other. It's a logical fallacy. Believing America is great does not mean it's equally great for everyone or that it can't be made better. And the people who benefit most from this country at the expense of those who work the hardest and benefit the least know that. They also know that by capitalizing on sincere pride in country, they can invade their responsibility for holding this country back. It is perhaps too early to know exactly what kind of intervention would have prevented yesterday's shooting. But a quick look around the world shows us that things could certainly be different. It's difficult to ignore the correlation between the sheer volume of guns in this country and the totally out of proportion scale of gun violence. In states where guns are prevalent, suicide rates are higher. There are about 120 guns per every 100 Americans. The country with the next highest number of guns per person, the Falkland Islands, has 62 guns per person. The country with the third highest per capita gun ownership rate is Yemen with about 53 guns per person. Consider that these are our bedfellows. It is also difficult to ignore the correlation between mass shooters and violence against women. According to a University of California law study, 80% of shooters had a history of domestic violence, and most killed a female relative or partner immediately before the mass shooting event. In this case, the, shooter's the shooter first shot his grandmother before targeting the children. It's not clear, as of saying this now, how the shooter procured his gun or whether pending gun legislation would have helped. But popular legislation is being held up right now, and not by Democratic will, but by senators who take millions of donations from the NRA. Mitt Romney, the number one recipient of NRA money, has taken nearly $14 million. Richard Burr of North Carolina has taken nearly $7 million. Roy Blunt of Missouri has taken over $4.5 million. And Marco Rubio of Florida has taken $3.3 million. It's fair to ask whether the decisions being made by these men are guided by the public interest or by corporate payoffs. Still, I don't know if pending legislation would have changed the outcome here, but it's worth noting that enforcement of current gun laws is likely not enough to change most outcomes. In 85% of the mass shootings that have occurred between 1982 and 2002, the weapons used were obtained legally. Only 16 incidents involved illegally obtained guns. I don't know what the but-for factors are behind this specific shooting, but I see people across the ideological spectrum, including Iglesias, using rhetorical tactics to shore up the status quo, a status quo that leads to America being an exceptional outlier in category kids killed at school. And so while we wait to learn more, and before this becomes a conversation reduced to thoughts and prayers and partisan mudslinging, I simply want to issue a warning. 
Things can be better, even in the greatest country in the history of the world. And of those who suggest critiquing America is a sign of ingratitude, it's worth asking, why can't our children survive a day in the best country in the history of the world? So, Robbie, obviously there's a lot that we don't know mm -hmm. right now, but I was frustrated because what Iglesias' tweet conveyed was so similar to what I've seen and experienced in many arguments. I recently did a debate with Charlie Kirk where he insisted that because you know, black people do better in America than other places, or because I personally have succeeded in my life, it means that things don't need to be improved for other people, or that this country can't be even if more great. If it's being used as a crutch to say things cannot be improved, I agree with you. However, I do think it is important, and maybe this was ill-timed, it's important for people to have perspective about the scale of our problems, because they can seem, daunt they can seem so bad that they inspire pessimism or even fatalism about how things are. But the fact is that we actually did decrease gun violence by like 50% from 1994 to 2010. We're not quite sure what we did right, but it, it was done that on, on a historical scale, we have actually substantially decreased violence. Uh, if you read Steven Pinker's book about the decline of violence over time from the, from the ancient period to the medieval period to the modern period, not just talking about in the American context. So none of that is to say, again, that we can't come up with better policies, or th that we don't have the capacity to come up with better policies. Now, I do you know, have some, uh, I, I don't, I'm not very persuaded that a lot of these policies would have, it, it, it is true that we have, we have more mass shootings than other countries. It is true. How we define, how mass shootings are defined ends up being a little tricky because the media is often going off of this database that counts any incident where four people were shot other than the shooter himself as a mass shooting. And that category does capture not just like what we saw yesterday, but also crime and yeah, which domestic is also violence. A problem. I think a lot of different kinds of communities are many, But many of those cases do involve, like I was looking down that list and right, last week there was, I forget where it was, right, it was, a, it was essentially a gang shoot. It was two it was teenagers on the streets and they had guns they're not supposed to have. They are not allowed to have these guns and they start fighting with, with each other. No one killed, but five people got shot. And that counts. That happens, does happen a lot in this country. I don't know how to solve that with with more gun law, maybe more enforcement of our existing gun laws, but then that would result in more confrontations between these people and the police, which is also something we've said we don't want. Well, no, it's the idea that we don't want confrontations that result in people's loss of life that's unnecessary. We don't want people right. kneeling on folks' necks and suffocating them to death uh, in front of the entire country when they're already subdued. Uh, right. I don't think that the outrage against police shootings is, you know, Outrage over some policeman and a gun and open, well, but what about open Jacob, gun what about, uh, what about Jacob but Blake? I wanna, what about the? I want to. I want to stick to this point because okay. the even if you take out all of the other mass shootings, we're talking about 27 school shootings. School yeah. shootings alone in the first five months of this year, and even I, I understand that you're not attempting to do this, but the natural psychological effect I think when you talk about the fact that. Um, you know, we're better than other countries. We've made, we've made improvements. Slavery is over. Brianna, why aren't you happy? That's not what you're saying, but that is mm -hmm. what has been said to me. You know, you got to go to Harvard. Why aren't you happy? Doesn't this mean that all black people are successful? I think it's such an obvious fallacy that people are really taken up by. Um, it's frustrating because it forces a lot of people into the, the position of denying the reality of progress, which I don't want to do. Of course, to the extent that crime, crime rates have lowered and there's some sociological studies about whether or not there was a peak in the 90s as a result of lead and the pipes in the 70s and all these other kind of things that were kind of outside of uh, uh, criminal justice policy control. But regardless, we should obviously be celebrating those gains. But what I think causes people to become disaffected are folks like Steven Pinker. I'm so glad you brought him up because he is like ground zero for this kind of behavior. His entire rationale is to say, look, China, you know, we, we don't live in mud huts anymore. Uh, we're not like stabbing each other with, with, with you know, uh, rocks or whatever. You know, we're not living in a medieval right. environment where people are dying of uh, cholera and smallpox, although many people in the country and in the world still are. And therefore what? And therefore what? And I just want people to ask that question when someone says something that to you, 
like that to you. Great, I'm glad we've improved. And therefore what? How is that germane to the issue that I'm bringing up that is still deeply painful and concerning to me and my community and my family that I want to be resolved? And I would also caution liberals that you don't have to pretend that progress hasn't happened. I see a lot of folks arguing that everything is exactly the same for minorities as it was right. 50 or 100 years ago. We hear that obviously with, not with true. racism in particular. But, but, but that shouldn't be the conversation. The conversation yeah. is not whether things have improved. It should be, are we going to work together to continue to make them better? Because the status quo is obviously insufficient for so many people. And because we are the greatest country in the history of the world, do we have that confidence that we can make it even better? I, I can honestly state that I don't know. Look, the, the mass school shootings are they are more prevalent here than other countries, but they are a, such a small percentage of gun deaths. I don't know what policy can reduce something that is more happens more than we want it to happen, but is already quite rare, like 0.2% of gun deaths. I do, I accept that, I think if there were stricter gun control laws, uh, suicides would be rare. I'm persuaded by looking at the evidence that uh, the number of gun suicides we have could be meaningfully decreased if we had stricter gun laws. I am not, however, inclined to limit other people's access, people who use firearms safely and legally and are not a threat to others, to limit their access to them because other people misuse them and harm themselves with them. Well, that seems fatalistic to me. If you believe there's no way to control for uh, an, an obviously unwell, because no one who does something like this is well, but an unhinged 18-year-old getting access to a gun, crashing his car, and shooting up an elementary school, we live in a society where we don't think plausibly we can keep guns from the hands of people like that. I think that's actually an indictment of the proliferation of guns in some of our more substantive rights in this country. Uh, and I'm not calling for that. I believe right. there is a way to keep people like that, keep all of these young disaffected people from one, being young and disaffected, and also from accessing guns. And I don't think that we can have a conversation about how impossible that is when there has been very little in the way of meaningful effort to actually try. I mean, keeping young disaffected, keeping teenagers, male teenagers, all of them male, from committing violence has been like the task of society for since as has long it, as society has existed. Has it been the task of society? Because I can think of some things that could be really beneficial in terms of social programs, keeping people occupied, keeping people in summer school classes, giving people the kind of community supports that used to exist, making sure that parents can stay in the home where we, we are going to end up talking right, to well, a guest later all, in we this. We do week. all those things. And having done some of those, we, we have reduced, we we have we reduced the amount things, of violence Robbie. that this population, which is responsible for the vast majority of violence in society, does create. Well, and we, should, we could do more of it, but I'm saying... We can do more of it. That's the key. Having done a little bit of something, usually something insufficient, is not an excuse, in my opinion, to not want to try to do more. And I think that, that it's a common but trap a, to fall in. But in a See society with some basic respect for people's rights and civil liberties, you will always have some amount of of inexplicable, unaccountable violence unless you live pivot. in a police state. That's the other pivot, Robbie. It's the freedoms it's of the true. families that just lost their kids or the teachers, the families that just lost those teachers who were killed, the freedom for them to walk the streets and go to work and go to school unimpacted by gun violence is never on the table. It's the people who are already benefiting society, and this was, this was the point of the radar. It's the people who generally live in a position where they don't have to deal with the cost of all of the negative freedoms that come from everyone else being able to live in a carte blanche libertarian laissez-faire world are never tabulated. And I think that those freedoms need to be protected as well. All right, well, we will have more rising after this. Thank you for that, Brianna, and stay with us.